Throughout the entirety of World War II, the most renowned artillery piece of the German army was the 88mm gun, extensively utilized on both the eastern and western fronts. Often referred to as the ACT Act, this artillery piece was capable of engaging aircraft and tanks, causing significant trouble for the Allied forces. However, it still harbored some mysteries. For instance, why was its caliber an unconventional 88mm? And how was it able to effectively engage tanks? Today's we are aiming to elucidate why the 88 gun held such dominance on the battlefields of World War II. Although the 88 gun was predominantly used by the German army during World War II, it was originally a naval artillery piece. In World War I, the German Navy employed 88mm caliber guns as early as 1904. These naval 88 guns, known as the 8.8cm SKL-35, featured breech loading and wedge-shaped breech blocks. Their primary purpose wasn't as anti-aircraft guns because, at the time, aircraft had insufficient payloads to threaten large naval vessels. Instead, the emerging threat to large naval vessels came from small torpedo boats armed with two to four steam torpedoes. These torpedo boats posed a serious threat and necessitated rapid-fire guns for defense. Thus, the 88mm naval rapid-fire gun was born out of this need. The choice of 88mm caliber for these anti-torpedo boat guns was not arbitrary. German weapon designers determined that the metal shell manufactured for an 88mm caliber gun, typically weighing around 15 kilograms, approximately 34 pounds, was the largest and heaviest shell that could be handled by a single person. Any larger caliber would require additional loaders or segmented charges, compromising the gun's rate of fire. In anti-torpedo boat operations, a low rate of fire could prove fatal, hence the selection of the 88mm caliber. Furthermore, the naval 88mm guns were not limited to a single type. During the Predreadnought era, various types of 88mm guns were employed for anti-torpedo boat duties. However, the original 8.8cm SKL-35 suffered from a low muzzle velocity due to its relatively short barrel length of 35 calibers. To overcome this limitation, all German Imperial Navy dreadnoughts during World War I were equipped with the 8.8cm SKL-45 gun, featuring a longer barrel with a length of 45 calibers. This longer barrel resulted in higher muzzle velocity, reaching approximately 890 meters per second, making it more effective against fast-moving targets and expanding its utility beyond anti-torpedo boat duties. Due to the exceptional anti-aircraft capabilities of the 88mm naval guns, they were utilized as high-angle guns on large warships during World War I. Additionally, they were mounted on fixed emplacements on land for anti-aircraft defense. These land-based 88 guns, known as the 8.8cm Kazuk Flak L45 or 8.8cm Flak 16 for Army versions, proved their effectiveness in both roles. After World War I, the 8.8cm SK L45 guns were installed on German armored cruisers and light cruisers, serving as dual-purpose guns. As World War I came to an end, Germany was prohibited from developing, producing, and possessing anti-aircraft guns under the Treaty of Versailles. This marked a turning point between the, the First World War 88 guns and the World War II 88 guns. However, as history has shown, the Treaty of Versailles did not deter Germany's military resurgence. German engineers circumvented the treaty's restrictions by sending young engineers abroad, including to countries like the Soviet Union, to study weapon manufacturing techniques. Meanwhile, in the late 1920s, the German government acquired a stake in the Swedish Bofors Company, renowned for its anti-aircraft guns. Collaborating with Bofors, German engineers successfully developed a large-caliber anti-aircraft gun, initially planned as a 75mm gun but later modified to 88mm during production. Thus, the 8.8 Flak 18, commonly known as the ACT ACT cannon, was born. Some people might wonder how a gun could be semi-automatic. 
The explanation is simple. After firing, the breech of the FLAC-18 automatically opened, ejecting the spent cartridge. The loader only needed to insert the next round, streamlining the loading process. A well-trained crew could achieve a firing rate of 15 to 20 rounds per minute, considered excellent during the early stages of World War II. In addition to its firing rate, the FLAC-18 remained similar to its World War I predecessors, featuring a cruciform gun carriage and a single pedestal mount. The gun could be mounted on a special carriage designated as the Sondern Hangar 201, enabling it to be towed by the common SD.KFZ.7 half-track vehicle. This combination allowed the gun to be swiftly deployed and utilized in various roles, including direct fire from the towing vehicle if necessary. What truly made the German 88 gun famous was its outstanding anti-tank capabilities on the ground battlefield. Within a range of 2 kilometers, it could penetrate the armor of most Allied tanks, causing considerable psychological distress among tank crews facing this anti-aircraft gun. However, most of the accounts of the 88 gun's anti-tank prowess found on the internet are highly inaccurate and can even be described as rumors. For instance, many online writers depict the history of the 88 gun's anti-tank actions as occurring during the Battle of France or in the North African. They claim that the German 3.7 cm PAK-36 was unable to penetrate the frontal armor of French Char B-1 tanks or British Matilda II tanks. Consequently, the Germans were forced to employ the 88mm anti-aircraft gun's large caliber to engage ground targets directly, thus defeating French or British tanks. However, people should spot the flaws in these rumors. For example, if the 88mm anti-aircraft gun was merely designed for anti-aircraft use, using it as an emergency measure against tanks would present two direct problems. Firstly, during World War II, most anti-aircraft guns were equipped with time-fused high-explosive shells, which were ineffective against tanks. Using the high-explosive shells associated with the 88 gun, which would result in shell fragments penetrating armor to a maximum depth of only 20 mm. It would be unrealistic to expect such ammunition to cause significant damage to early heavy tanks like the B-1 or Matilda II. Secondly, for anti-aircraft guns, their primary targets were aircraft, not ground units. Therefore, most anti-aircraft guns from World War I were not designed for firing at ground targets and lacked the necessary elevation. However, the 88mm anti-aircraft gun, despite its high mount, still had a minus 3 degree depression angle and was equipped with sights for engaging ground targets. This demonstrates that the designers anticipated the 88 gun's importance as direct fire support on the battlefield and tailored its design accordingly. Even more cleverly, the 88 gun was originally designed as anti-torpedo boat artillery, meaning its ammunition had to be capable of penetrating torpedo boat holes and causing casualties among the crew. The ammunition stores of the 8.8 cm SKL-45 naval gun included armor-piercing shells weighing 9.5 kg, which were capable of penetrating around 100 mm of vertical armor at a range of 2,000 meters. This made it an absolute star for countering ground heavy armored units from the outset. Thus, the 88 gun already possessed absolute anti-armor capabilities from the beginning of its story making its long-range elimination of Allied heavy-armored units in the French or North African campaigns entirely expected and not some emergency measure. The 88 gun was so versatile that it became a cultural symbol of the Second World War, to the extent that even the Allies failed to distinguish between the various models. They simply referred to all guns mounted on cruciform carriages with single pedestals as 88 guns. Even when under attack by other direct fire weapons, terrified crews would often shout for an 88. However, in reality, just like the distinction between the Flak 16 and Flak 18, the German 88 gun used a complete family of models. Prior to World War II, due to the Treaty of Versailles abolishing the Flak 16 anti-aircraft gun, the first type of 88 gun to be introduced into service was the Flak 18. But how did it get its name? The reason why the Flak 18 was given this name doesn't seem much different from the Flak 16 of the First World War. This was due to a German sleight of hand. 
The German numbering naming convention wasn't a step naming system, but rather a naming system based on years. For instance, the FLAC 16 was actually the FLAC 1916. According to the Treaty of Versailles, Germany was not allowed to possess anti-aircraft guns after the war. If they introduced anti-aircraft guns into service during the interwar period, they would face sanctions from Britain and France. Therefore, the Germans came up with a plan to name a series of weapons produced during the interwar period as something 18. For example, the Flak 18 was meant to make Britain and France believe that these weapons had already been finalized by the end of World War I and were not designed and produced during the interwar period, thus evading most of the sanctions. The second type of 88 gun was the Flak 36, the most prolific derivative in the family. Its primary difference from the Flak 18 was the adoption of a two-piece barrel design. This clever design divided the barrel into inner and outer sections. When the rifling of the inner barrel wore out, only the inner barrel needed to be replaced, saving costs and making transportation and maintenance more convenient. Additionally, the Flak 36 was the first to use gun shields that are frequently seen in historical films. This sloping rectangular shield was designed for ground combat and completely shielded the gun crew from horizontal fire, protecting them from small arms and shell fragments, although it couldn't stop large caliber ammunition, such as .50 caliber machine gun rounds. But still, it was better than nothing. The shield received unanimous praise from the gun crews in combat. Therefore, this large shield was later applied to older Flak 18 guns and became standard equipment for all subsequent 88 guns. The third type of 88 gun was the Flak 37, which differed little from the Flak 36, but was mainly geared towards aerial combat. Therefore, it was similar to the Flak 18 in many respects. Its main feature was having two fuse setters compared to the Flak 36 one. During anti-air combat, ammunition handlers in the gun crew would take turns inserting the timed fuse explosive shell heads into them, and the fuse setters would automatically twist the timing rings on the shell heads precisely according to the data transmitted by the fire control system. From this point, it can also be seen that the Flak 37 was inclined towards anti-aircraft combat. However, although the Flak 183637 were three different designations, they could all be collectively referred to as the first generation 88 guns because their components were highly interchangeable, especially on the harshly fought Eastern Front, where mixed parts were not uncommon. The second generation 88 gun was the famous Flak 41. It's easy to distinguish. To achieve higher muzzle velocities, it not only lengthened the barrel to 74 calibers, later reduced to 72 calibers, but also used ammunition with a larger propellant charge, allowing its maximum range to reach 16,000 yards. General Otto Wilhelm von Renz praised its combat effectiveness, stating it was almost equal to 128 mm caliber. Besides the increased initial velocity from the longer barrel, the ammunition played a significant role in extending its maximum range. Unlike the 88 x by 551mm are shells fired by the first generation 88 guns, the ammunition for the second generation was enhanced to 88 by 855mm R, nearly a third longer. Additional charge of the ammunition was the main driving force behind its extended range. In addition to the two generations of 88 guns mentioned above, there is another type of 88 gun that is independent of these two generational classifications, namely the 8.8 cm Flak 3741. From its name, it's not difficult to see that this gun is based on the first generation 88 guns, but can fire second generation ammunition. It was a compromise measure taken by the German military to enhance the performance of the first generation 88 guns. However, due to the rapid defeat of Germany in World War II, this special type of 88 gun was only produced 13 in total and is more commonly found in archives than in the field. By now, the basic parameters of the 88mm gun should be clear. So, if you were assigned to act as an 88mm gun commander, how would you operate the gun for anti-aircraft combat? In combat, an 88mm gun crew typically consists of 6 to 11 people, mainly differing in the number of loaders. The more loaders there are, the closer the firing rate approaches the limit of 20 rounds per minute. 
A standard 88mm gun crew consists of nine people, including an elevation gunner, a direction gunner, a loader, four ammunition handlers, and an anti-aircraft gun commander. However, a single gun is not enough for anti-aircraft operations in a World War II environment, so the minimum deployment unit for the 88mm gun is an anti-aircraft gun battery, which typically includes four 88mm guns and additional anti-aircraft searchlights. When setting up gun positions, you would need to command trailers to place the guns on flat and open ground, rather than in sturdy bunkers with roofs, since you are commanding an anti-aircraft gun, not a fortress gun. Because the probability of damaging enemy aircraft with four guns in a battery is still too low, if you want to shoot down an aircraft under World War II fire control conditions, you would need more guns to create a barrage against enemy aircraft and rely on timed high-explosive shells to hit and down enemy aircraft through probabilistic calculations. Therefore, in homeland air defense operations against bomber formations, a dozen or so anti-aircraft gun batteries would form a large anti-aircraft gun platform to attack aircraft entering their firing range. Of course, when you see enemy aircraft, if you don't have accurate fire control data, shooting with anti-aircraft guns is useless. If you want to hit enemy aircraft accurately, you need to measure the speed and altitude of the aircraft. Only when the air observation post observes the aircraft and enters the shooting elements calculation will an anti-aircraft battle truly begin. After the observation post measures the speed and altitude of the enemy aircraft through triangulation, the mechanical computer coupled with the rangefinder will apply a fixed formula based on the rangefinder's recorded values to issue the delay time for the ammunition and shooting elements. When visibility is poor, the Wurzburg anti-aircraft radar takes over the role of the optical rangefinder. It can provide altitude and speed information for at least four anti-aircraft guns via cables. The more cables connected, the more guns can receive radar information. This is also one of the earliest batches of radar-concentrated anti-aircraft guns in the world. After gun emplacement receives fire control information, your elevation gunner and direction gunner will set the shooting elements, while the ammunition handlers will insert delayed fuses into the high-explosive shells. When the fuse is inserted into the fuse setter, the mechanical structure will automatically set a delay. When the shooting elements and the fuse are set, all preparation work is completed. At this point, you just need to have the loader push the shell into the chamber, and the gunner can fire the shell and open fire on the enemy aircraft. After that, just repeat the tedious process of loading firing until you hear the command to stop firing. During this process, the anti-aircraft gun group will spread out a black cloud in the sky along the path of the enemy aircraft at different altitudes and distances presenting a rectangular arrangement that maximizes the probability of hitting the enemy with fragments in each corner of the box filled with fragments. However, this kind of anti-aircraft combat only looks good at the first glance and is almost useless against strategic bombing by the Allies. This is the Wurzburg radar is not accurate enough to meet the small effective range of timed high-explosive shell, thus has little effect on heavy bombers like the B-17. So, this poor accuracy is also a direct reason for the inefficiency of anti-aircraft guns. If you want to directly shoot down heavy bombers, you can only rely on shells directly hitting the enemy aircraft, but this direct hit requires a lot of luck. If you really have that luck, then you wouldn't be an anti-aircraft gun commander in the German army, you would have won the jackpot and gone to live in Switzerland. Therefore, in German homeland air defense, anti-aircraft guns are generally used for interception, while the task of shooting down enemy aircraft relies on fighter aircraft. However, starting from 1943, Germany could no longer provide enough fighter aircraft to counterattack bomber formations. Furthermore, due to the box formation of heavy bombers, existing fighter aircraft could no longer easily break through bomber formations without pressure. It would require more effort to approach a distance where they could shoot down bombers, and it would be even more difficult. In addition, in 1944, the U.S. Army Air Forces began equipping P-51D aircraft, and bombers were closely guarded by long-range escort fighter formations. As a result, the number of casualties among American bomber formations began to decline sharply. 
Even without so many preconditions, air defense still have limited effect on heavy bombers because air defense positions are not easily moved, while bombers only need to make a small turn to avoid them. Since 1944, air defense firepower has been more of a moral support for the people rather than an effective weapon against Allied bomber formations. In the end, the Allied victory in the world anti-fascist war led to the gradual transition of large-caliber anti-aircraft guns by emerging anti-aircraft missiles. The 88mm anti-aircraft gun was no longer needed by the military. Radar began to participate in field air defense, and anti-aircraft missiles combined with small-caliber anti-aircraft guns became the direction of development for various countries. If people want to see the glory of the 88mm gun, they can only see it in games or movies.